Okay, Gerald. Morning, everyone. It is time for us to get started. Please get your songbook and turn to number 259. together again on this Lord's Day to worship you and to hear a message from your word, to lift our voice in prayer and to lift our voice in song. And we pray, Father, that all that we do will be in accordance with your will and pleasing to you. We ask you, Father, this morning to be with those that aren't here due to health problems, comfort them and strengthen those that are attending to them, Father, give them all a, a measurable portion of health once again. We pray also for the spiritually sick, those who have cho chosen to be somewhere other than here, Father. We pray that they will realize their condition and want to return to the fold once again. As we continue through this service, Father, we ask your blessings upon the speakers. May the message be something that will encourage us to help us share our love in the gospel with others. Forgive our sins and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Sam Carrico with us from Eastside, filling in for Mark today. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Let's get the 
harder and harder to get up from your seat these days. It's good to be here. I thank you for inviting me, or whoever invited me. Maybe it was just Mark. I don't know. <laughs> but I have preached here before. It's been a while. I think I look back at my sermon schedules. I think I've preached here uh, getting close to 30 times. Uh, but it's been a while, so I'm, I'm glad to be back again. But uh, I'm also glad that you've got a really good preacher in Mark. So I've heard him preach a few times, and, and I know he can bring the word. Today I'd like to talk about something that uh, I'm sure everybody in here doesn't have a problem with, but maybe you do, so we're going to touch on it anyway. And uh, it's something that the world could sure uh, have some knowledge about, more than they have. And uh, it's about, can we believe the Bible? There's a lot of people that just don't believe in the Bible anymore. It's getting to be more and more people that just think that it's a, it's a good old book, has a lot of good sayings in it, a lot of good stories, but it, it's just not believable. So today I, I want to go through some proofs that I think uh, you may find interesting. We have 5,480 manuscripts of the Greek New Testament in the world today. 5,480. That's a lot of, a lot of manuscripts. A and we have 116 papyri of, uh, that dates all the way back to the second and third century. We're talking about the 100s and the 200s. That's a long time ago. And, and the closer you get to the time that the events happened, the, the preaching happened, uh, the, the more accurate they're going to be. And 98% of all these things are in agreement. And you say, well, 98%, that means there's 2% error. No, it doesn't mean there's 2% error. It means there's 2% differences in <coughs> what, one, uh, what one thing might say and what another might say. <coughs> that includes things like spelling and, and uh, order, or maybe they have a, a word out of order or something like that, but the thoughts and all that are close to 100%. So uh, we, we don't have any worries about what we have out there that we got our Word of God from this. This right here is is, is not the, the original writings. Those were in Greek and Hebrew and a little bit in Aramaic. We have them in English today. Thank goodness because <laughs> I don't think I would do very good at, at Greek. I'm still working on English and I'm 77 years old. So, uh, you know, it's, it's just uh, that we need to use the language that we have for our, our word. In, in A.D. 303, a long time ago, that was uh, uh, right before uh, we, we had somebody that came in and, uh, and, and that, that believed in Christianity. That was Constantine. But we had Diocletian, who was the Roman emperor, and he hated Christians. He hated Christians with passion, and he attempted to destroy them. And he wanted not only to destroy Christians, but to take down the Bible. He sent a, a letter out to all the provinces saying, get rid of them, burn them, gather them up. If you've got Christians out there that, that won't recount, or recant rather, uh, and, and uh, turn away from Christ and, and want to, to go a different path, if, if you can't get them to change their mind, we'll, we'll kill them. That was his philosophy, get, get rid of it. So uh, he, he, he did all that, and, and he, was, he died. And the irony of all of this about him trying to get rid of the Bibles is he was followed by Constantine. I don't know if you've ever heard of Constantine, but he was the first Roman emperor. Uh, we don't know if he became actually became a Christian, but he, he promoted Christianity. 
And he may have become a Christian. We just don't have the proof of it. His mother became a Christian. Uh, and and uh, it's actually called, you know, the way the Catholic Church did things, they actually called her a saint. So uh, he, had, he had it in his mind. He, he believed a lot of things they were saying, I'm sure. But uh, he, uh, he changed things around. And the emperor that he was, he followed Diocletian and he, he changed the rules that Diocletian had put into effect to burn things. He promoted the Bible. He actually had a man named Eusebius that prepared 50 copies of the scriptures. Now, this isn't like going to the printing press. This is where you have somebody sit down and hand copy these things. And he had 50 copies promoted and, and prepared at the expense of the government. He, he did a lot of things for Christianity. He, he made it legal to be a Christian again. So that was a good thing. There's another man a lot closer to us in history. He's only going back uh, to 1778. He had a fellow named Voltaire. He was a French writer and philosopher. He was very well known, uh, very prominent. He said that in 100 years from his time, from the time he died, that Christianity would fade into obscurity. Within a hundred, he was such an atheist and he promoted atheism that he said, the Bible's going to go away. Nobody's going to believe it anymore. But what really happened? When Voltaire died and passed into history, the circulation of the Bible increased tremendously. And what, what's really funny about this whole thing, and not funny, it's sad that he was going that way, but he boasted that Christianity would fade away and the Bible would go away, but 50 years after his death, the Geneva Bible Society bought his house and his printing presses. He had printing presses to write books against Christianity, but they bought those and they used them to turn out volumes of Bibles. Produced stacks of Bibles. And Christianity just kept on growing. You know, when you spread the word around, well, the word promotes Christianity, and, 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 and Christians grow from that. That's, that's how we get strong Christians, is through the word. So let's just look at the New Testament for a minute. Can we trust the New Testament? Harvey W. Amherst, in his book, The Divine Demonstration, lists seven criteria uh, by which historic Testimony might be tested. In other words, this just isn't biblical stuff. This is for anything. George Washington, did he exist? Well, you, you go look at the historical facts. Napoleon, did he exist? Well, you, you go list the things that were written about him, and you, you can find out that, well, yeah, he was he was the Emperor of France and he did, did all these fantastic battles and, and one land and then was exiled. We, we know all those things because of the testimony and the things. But he lists seven criteria that test historical facts. So I want to, this will take just, just a moment, but uh, I want to list these seven. The first one is when witnesses are honest, competent, and have the opportunity to know. When they're honest, competent, and have the opportunity to know. Now here's an honest man, Peter. Peter from the Bible. Peter said that they were not attempting to deceive anyone, but were eyewitnesses. Eyewitnesses. The best proof that you can have is an eyewitness. In a trial today in society, you know, two, two eyewitnesses will put a guy in jail real fast. Those guys are honest, confident, and are eyewitnesses. Well, Peter was an eyewitness. He said he and the other apostles were not attempting to deceive, but were eyewitnesses of things they proclaimed. 2 Peter 1.16 says, For we did not follow cunningly the 
uh, devised fables when we may know to you the power and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Number two, when witnesses agree in a general statement, although they may differ on some minor points. Acts 2, 26, Paul before King Agrippa said this, the Apostle Paul, verse 26, for the king before whom I speak freely knows these things. He says, do you know these things already, Agrippa? For I am convinced that none of these things escapes his attention since this thing was not done in a corner. He said it was done, all this stuff was done out in the open. People could see it. And they knew it was true. And nobody complained that the things that they were writing down were false statements. You know, if, if things like that were done today, I mean, you'd have news people all over, wouldn't you? And it's the same back then, except, except more individually. Point number three, when there is no known motive for misrepresentation. Now again, we're going through these seven points that show something is true when statements are made. When there's no known motive for misrepresentation. The apostles and preachers of the first century didn't become rich. Now they became famous. But uh, they, they weren't honored by the men of that time because of their testimony. In fact, history records their numerous persecutions. They, they were in dire straits most of their lives. They were persecuted by the Romans, by the Jews, and sometimes by their own folks. They had difficult lives, and, and, and they, uh, as they tried to, to, to describe the life of Jesus Christ and preach his gospel. Point number four, when the facts recorded are strongly against, now look, listen to this, strongly against the interests of the narrator. In other words, the guy teaching or preaching or writing down these things, is this helping him? No, as a matter of fact, it's probably hurting him physically and maybe emotionally, but not spiritually. Acts recorded the persecution of the church and those who suffered for their faith, including Stephen and James, who became <coughs> martyrs. Now, we know what a martyr is. It's a guy that stands up for what he believes and, and somebody kills him because of it. Tradition teaches that all of the apostles suffered death for their teachings except for the Apostle John who was in prison for the last years of his life on the Isle of Patmos. You can read about that in Revelation 1, 9, and 10. Number five, when such witnesses are numerous, if you have a whole lot of witnesses saying something, well, that, that just, just drives it home that it must be true. If they're honorable witnesses. When such witnesses are numerous. Jesus made several appearances in the 40 days after his resurrection. And demonstrated himself to be the son of God by convincing proofs. We can read that in Acts 1, 1 through 3. Paul said that Jesus appeared to more than 500 brethren at the same time. Got 500 people out there listening to him speak at the same time and saw him after his death and resurrection. We can read about that in 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 10. Number six, when the recorded facts and existing facts are harmonious, the places, people, culture, and circumstances recorded by the authors represented the way they really were. The New Testament is not filled with names, mythical people, who could never have lived, rather archaeology and secular and historical records support their credibility and the credibility of the New Testament. The dates of the New Testament match historic realities. 
In other words, when you, you, you go find what other sources say about dates that things happen in the New Testament has those dates recorded, they they match. So another another proof. The last one is number seven. When the facts recorded are sub sustained by existing monuments, coins, games, or other public institutions. You know, things that were practical of that day. The fact that the church exists is a marvelous testimony to the resurrection of Jesus Christ and to the truth of the apostles' teaching. The fact that this church is here today. This, this is one more proof that Jesus Christ died for our sins and resurrection and resurrected and back in heaven sitting at the right hand of God the Father. It's just one more proof. I mean, why else could this church be here? The fact that the church uh, exists is a marvelous testimony to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There would never have been a church had the apostles not believed in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If, if they just were following Jesus while he was alive, then didn't really come to the forefront after his death, then, then the church would have never been built. It would have never survived. In fact, today the churches in, in this day meet every first day of the week. The Lord's Day, Resurrection Day, is testimony to the fact that the events of the New Testament are real. So we have those seven proofs. And they're solid proofs. If you had that in a court of law, things like that, someone would be released or convicted based on that kind of testimony. Now let's look back to the Old Testament for a minute. We've been talking more about the New but there's things in the Old Testament that, that proves that, that, that it's active, that it's from God, that we can use it for, for sure in, in our, our belief system. And there's several things that, that I want to mention. One is predictive prophecy. The Bible has a thing called predictive prophecy. And that's when somebody gets up and says something. And then later it becomes true. And there's some fantastic predictive prophecies in, in the Old Testament. Joshua 5, 26 is one of my favorites. That was the, the time after they'd gone into the promised land and Joshua made them take an oath at that time saying, Cursed before the Lord is the man who rises up and builds the city of Jericho. Now they just marched around the the city of Jericho for, for six days, marched around it, and then the seventh day, marched around it seven times, blew the trumpets, and made a loud shout, and what happened? The walls came tumbling down. Now, what he's saying, cursed is, is the man who tries to rebuild this city. I mean, he's putting a curse on whoever would do that. And this is the curse. With the loss of his firstborn shall he lay its foundation. In other words, whoever would try to do this would lose his firstborn child. And then, more than that, with the loss of his youngest son shall he set up its gates. And you, we can read, it, read about that in the, in the Bible. I'm going to show you exactly where if you're taking note. 1 Kings 16.34 1 Kings 16, 34. In his days, King Ahab, I, or in his days, it's talking about King Ahab here. Hael, the Bethelite, built Jericho and laid its foundation with the loss of Abraham, his firstborn, and set up the gates with the loss of his youngest son, Segub, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Joshua, the son of Nun. Okay, so those two things happened. Now, if you go back to Joshua, that was done in 1400 B.C., 1400 years before Christ. If you go to that second scripture that I read, that happened in 870 B.C., more or less. 
as well as you can determine it from, from the word. That's 530 years difference. So it took 530 years for that curse to be manifest, for the prophecy to come true, but it happened. One more from predicted prophecy, and this is one of my favorites, is, is, is uh, Cyrus. You can read about Cyrus in Isaiah 44, 28. This is from the words of as penned by our, uh, Isaiah. Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and he shall perform all my pleasure, saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built, and to the temple your foundation shall be laid. That was written by Isaiah. That was well before Cyrus was even born. That was written in approximately 720 B.C. If you go to Ezra 1.1, now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. That's when he let the people direct themselves back to, to the promised land after being in captivity for 70 plus years. That happened in 488 B.C. 232 years difference. Now can you imagine somebody if we sat down here today and wrote something about something that's going to happen 230 years from now and put the name of the man that's going to do it into writing? That's predictive prophecy, folks. And that's, that is amazing. That it said that uh, Alexander the Great when he was going through the countryside defeating people, Persia and in Egypt, and he sort of bypassed Jerusalem. He stopped there for a while, and they showed him this scripture. They showed him this scripture, and, and, and it, it made him, I wouldn't say fearful, for Alexander wasn't a fearful man, but it made him stand back and say, well, maybe I'll not destroy Jerusalem. I'll just go all around it. And, and that's a historical. You can read about that in, in the, the works of Josephus. Another way that you can tell is messianic prophecies are fulfilled. Many prophecies Jesus fulfilled were totally beyond the power of human control. I'm going to go through these a little quicker, and I'm sure you'll recognize the, the, the happenings and, and the verses what it, and what it means. Messianic prophecies. What's that mean? It's prophecies about the, the Messiah that's coming. And this was written in the Old Testament. Micah 5 2 says, talks about the place of the Messiah's birth, Bethlehem. Daniel 9 24 through 27, the 70 weeks prophecy, talks about the approximate time of Jesus' birth or Christ's birth, the time of his birth. Isaiah 7, 14 talks about the manner of Jesus' birth from a, a virgin woman. Zechariah 11, 12 through 14 talks about Jesus' betrayal. I was betrayed by one of his own. Numbers 21, 9 and uh, Deuteronomy 21, 23 talks about the manner of Jesus' crucifixion. Psalms 27, 7, and 8 talks about the people's reaction to the Messiah's death. Said they were scornful. They sh shot out their lip. Like, hmm, who's he think he is? And so they're sort of paying him no mind and being very disrespectful. Psalm 22, 16, Zechariah 12, 10 talks about the piercing of his feet and his hands. Things, things that they were talking about, it's obviously it's talking about the Messiah. But this happened hundreds of years before Jesus was born, let alone before he died. 
Isaiah 53, 9 talks about his burial. He will be buried with the rich. And where was he buried? He was buried in a rich man's tomb. Concerning these eight prophecies, Peter Stoner in a book, he was a mathematician and a statistician, he wrote a book called Science Speaks. He was also a Christian man. He estimated the probability of anyone fulfilling all of these things, all of these eight prophecy was one times 10 to the 17th power. Now I, I know all of us has been a long time since we've studied math in school. What's that mean? One times 10 to the 17th. It's not a million, one in a million. It's not one in a, uh, a billion. It's not one in a trillion. It's one in quadrillion. It's a one with 17 zeros after. That's high odds. I don't think you'd go to Vegas with those kind of odds. So then there's the, the point about scientific foreknowledge in the Bible. In the Old Testament, the earth is round, Isaiah 40, 22. The most seaworthy design for a ship is 350 by 30. Genesis 6, 15. Moses, I mean Noah, when he's building the, the ark, God told him what dimensions should be. The water cycle. People back then didn't know what a water cycle was. We, you know, it wasn't really determined until the 17th century that it was such a thing as a water cycle. You know, where the, the, the water is evaporating in the air, it rains, it falls down into the rivers and lakes, goes down to the ocean, is evaporated, and starts all over again. But the Bible talks about that. Infinite number of stars. The infinite number of stars that God was, was, was uh, telling Abraham about his offspring would go out to being innumerable like the stars. Innumerable. That means you can't count them. And you're saying you can't count the stars because there's too many. It's almost, well, you could say it, infinite. I don't I, I can't comprehend infinite. I can't understand it, but I know there's a lot of them out there. He talks about the oceans have fresh springs in Job 38, 16. That wasn't discovered in 1920. But the, they have proved that the ocean has springs that come up from the depths. So it's fresh water. And then they, he talks about the psalm. Uh, Psalms 8, 8 talks about this, that the oceans have paths. The oceans have paths in them. Gulf Stream is an excellent example. And there's others besides, the, I guess the Gulf Stream was the first one that was, dis was discovered. And it was by a fellow by the name of Matthew Fontaine Murray. He was a, a professor at uh, VMI. He, before that, he was a military officer in the, in the, the uh, war between the states. But he read Psalms 8, 8. And then as his capacity as, as an oceanographer, which was what his uh, professorship was at at VMI, he had the means to go out and, and test things. And he determined that the Gulf Stream was a stream in the ocean, that it was a, a path through the ocean. And the Bible talks about it, Psalms 8, 8. So he, he's one of these guys that took what the Bible says and nobody else believed it, so he went out and tried to prove it, and he did. I think one of the biggest ones uh, to me is uh, that Jesus believed the Scriptures, the Old Testament Scriptures, and he talked about it. He talked about creation in Matthew 19, 4. He talked about the flood in Matthew 24, 37, and 38, he talked about the widow who fed Elijah in Luke 4, 25, and 26. He talked about Naaman the leper in Luke 4, 27. He talked about the repentance of Nineveh that uh, Jonah's preaching caused him to repent in Matthew 12, 41. He talked about Daniel the prophet. 
in Matthew 24, 15. And he remembered Lot's wife, or he talked about Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife, he said, in Luke 17, 32. So all these proofs proving the, the, the accuracy and the reliability of the Old Testament Scripture. One more thing, and we'll wrap it up. It's medical advice from the Bible. Blood is necessary for life. Leviticus 17, 11 through 14 talks about that. That, that was determined medically in, in the 19th century, folks, in the 1800s. Both the man and woman possessed the seed of life. Genesis 3.15 and again in 22.18. Leviticus 17, 12 through 14 says that eating animal blood is bad practice. And I don't know people that, that eat animal. I'm sure there's people out there that eat animal blood, or drink animal blood. But it's not healthy. Science knows that today. Leviticus 13 through 15, four chapters in the Bible. Or is that three? 13, 14, three chapters in the Bible. Talk about quarantine principles. They were talking about for leprosy. Quarantine for leprosy, but it applies today. We know that, the, the, that it, at certain times we need to quarantine ourselves or have other people quarantine because of diseases that they might have. That was from the Old Testament before people really understood those kind of things. Deuteronomy 23, 12 through 14 has uh, some statements in there that human waste should be buried away from camp, away from people. That also that burning and washing of yourself and clothes and you're coming in contact with a diseased animal or a diseased person something that should be done. We can read about that in Numbers 19, 5 through 22. So, seeing all these things, can we trust the Bible? Can we trust it? Especially the, the New Testament and the, and the Old Testament. He who is the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you, these things I have written to you, who believe in the name of the Son of God in order that you may know that you have eternal life. 1 John 5, 12 through 13. We can be sure that the Bible is accurate. There's just too much proof, and it's proof that would apply in the court of law today and should apply in our belief in the Bible today. I'll leave you with